Even this must have a preface. That is a literary preface, laughed Yvonne, and I am a poor hand at making one. You see, my action takes place in the 16th century, and at that time, as you probably learnt at school, it was customary in poetry to bring down heavenly powers on earth. Not to speak of Dante, in France, clerks as well as the monks in the monasteries used to give regular performances in which the Madonna, the saints, the angels, Christ and God himself were brought on the stage. In those days it was done in all simplicity. In Victor Hugo's Notre Dame de Paris, an edifying and gratuitous spectacle was provided for the people in the Hôtel de Ville of Paris in the reign of Louis XI, in honor of the birth of the Dauphin. It was called Le Bon Jugement de la Très Sainte et Gracieuse Vierge Marie, and she appears herself on the stage and pronounces her Bon Jugement. Similar plays, chiefly from the Old Testament, were occasionally performed in Moscow, too, up to the times of Peter the Great. But besides plays, there were all sorts of legends and ballads scattered about the world, in which the saints and angels and all the powers of heaven took part when required. In our monasteries, the monks busied themselves in translating, copying, and even composing such poems, and even under the Tatars. There is, for instance, one such poem, of course from the Greek, The Wanderings of Our Lady Through Hell, with descriptions as bold as Dante's. Our Lady visits hell, and the archangel Michael leads her through the torments. She sees the sinners and their punishment. There she sees, among others, one noteworthy set of sinners in a burning lake. Some of them sink to the bottom of the lake so that they can't swim out, and these God forgets. An expression of extraordinary depth and force. And so Our Lady, shocked and weeping, falls before the throne of God and begs for mercy for all in hell, for all she has seen there indiscriminately. Her conversation with God is immensely interesting. She beseeches him, she will not desist, and when God points to the hands and feet of her son, nailed to the cross, and asks, how can I forgive his tormentors? She bids all the saints, all the martyrs, all the angels and archangels, to fall down with her and pray for mercy on all without distinction. It ends by her winning from God a respite of suffering every year from Good Friday till Trinity Day and the sinners at once raise a cry of thankfulness from hell, chanting, Thou art just, O Lord, in this judgment. Well, my poem would have been of that kind if it had appeared at that time. He comes on the scene in my poem, but he says nothing, only appears and passes on. Fifteen centuries have passed since he promised to come in his glory. Fifteen centuries since his prophet wrote, Behold, I come quickly. I will say to the mountain of the sun and tell the sun. We harbor no fears. We have no guarded ends to serve. We suspect no enemy. We contemplate or apprehend no conflict. Content with what we have, we seek nothing which is another. We only wish to do with you that finer, nobler thing which no nation can do alone. We wish to sit with you, able to internate to understand the war. In good conscience, we are eager to meet you right And in fight and often cooperation. The world demands a focus contemplation of the existing others. The realization that there can be no cure without sacrifice. Not by one of us, but by all of us. We do not mean to end his rights to inherit freedom or denied aspiration or ignored nationalism. Our Republic would no more act for these to be destroyed. No pride be beyond them. No nationality to vote. I would have a merchant of mine committing all of us to less population for war, more enjoyment of fortune. The higher hope to come with the spirit of our coming together. It is but just to recognize the very unique and peculiar position. Nothing can be accomplished in this regard of national apprehension. Rather, we should act together to remove the causes of apprehension. It is not to be done in any street. 
Greater assurance is found in the exchange of simple honesty and correction. Among men resolve to accomplish as the common leaders among nations. Uncivilization itself has come to a crucial state. It is not to be challenged if government fails, but the excess of its cost robs the people of the way to happen it, the opportunity to achieve. If the planner sentiments were not urgent, cold, hard, and black to the church of cost, the eloquence of economics would urge us to reduce our honor. If the concept of a better order does not appeal, then let us ponder the burden and the plight of continued competition. It is not to be denied that the world has gone along throughout the ages without heeding this call from the kindlier hearts of men. But the same world never before was so tragically brought to realization of the utter futility of action's sway when reason and conscience and fellowship find a nobler way. I can speak officially only for our United States. Our hundred million, frankly, wants less of armament and none of war. Anarchy. Anarchy is a word which comes from the Greek and signifies, strictly speaking, without government, the state of a people without any constituted authority.
government is necessary, and that without government there must be disorder and confusion, it is natural and logical to suppose that anarchy, which signifies without government, must also mean absence of order. Nor is this fact without parallel in the history of words. In those epochs and countries where people have considered government by one man, monarchy, necessary, the word republic, that is, the government of many, has been used precisely like anarchy to imply disorder and confusion. Traces of this signification of the word are still to be found in the popular language of almost all countries. When this opinion is changed and the public convinced that the government is not necessary but extremely harmful, the word anarchy, precisely because it signifies without government, will become equal to saying natural order, harmony of the needs and interests of all, complete liberty with complete solidarity. Therefore, those are wrong who say that anarchists have chosen their name badly because it is erroneously understood by the masses and leads to a false interpretation. The error does not come from the word, but from the thing. The difficulty which anarchists meet with in spreading their views does not depend upon the name they have given themselves, but upon the fact that their conceptions strike at all the inveterate prejudices that people have about the function of government. What is the soul? One. One night, I dreamt that I was in another world, world as a and I saw how the angels stretched out their hands, hands from heaven, a little and they caught hold of the soul of the who will be eternal, who often put his angels to them, those that were clean and white. Then I remember, who of the same on the day of the day, as though into paradise, Rome, the, the dirty one was born in my mother's skirt. And the teacher had golden tips of ice beside one night. I woke up and saw the fruit of their skull of gold up and washed them from the sky. The master bag and spray were boiled and the lie was buried in my health cup. And I began to scream. But the dirt was squeezed out of one of the people and they were iron. Dressed me of the soul and led me away from one end of the neighbor to the other. When I saw our bear, what is spoiled, I did not, I recognized the soul of my straw and scattered on had his long hill. The glass of the hollow she was covered over, his point of the cane, wrapped in war and was large, and my mother sat on a low stool. They washed up, and it only looked she laughed to weep loudly, and then an angel called out to cry, What is the soul of the heretical core? Then, that is oil the angel of her name. The sides were a lot of his ways, and your soul and would be as black as you told me that my father it would be now. washed by me, and that his soul washed so itself it through a and tied it head on I will that not walk in his way! I cried out in my body, straight up. My mother woke me and took my and head and fancy from my soul. Was the what is it, my treasure? She asked. You are bathed in perspiration, the helper that she blew upon me. Come, 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 the few birds who passed me. Mother, why, I have been in the other world. Early next morning, my mother asked me in all seriousness, but no, if I had seen my little soul was alive. I knew my soul was not alive. What a pity, what a pity, she lamented. You would certainly have given you a message for me. You silly. He said, well, those are birds. What, what are must birds? be done? If the teacher even after me, I asked my mother. For his I'll own sake, still more for me than that morning, I wished to save the episode. And I described to him the whole of my dream. When he said, I was foolish. I paid no attention to more than the the comment. He wanted to prove to me as luck out of the Bible and the tall Sarah that dreams were rubbish. This but I did not tell you know if my real name was good enough or whether the boys knew that I saw clearly the news that he was wrong. And I knew that his sense of out of the was terrible on the That I ought to avoid the desert of place. He said he was like to ruin my soul. Right now, he would say, but again, I am 
Was It a Dream by Guy de Maupassant I had loved her madly. Why does one love? Why does one love? How queer it is to see only one being in the world, to have only one thought in one's mind, only one desire in the heart, and only one name on the lips a name which comes up continually, rising like the water in a spring, from the depths of the soul to the lips, a name which one repeats over and over again, which one whispers ceaselessly, everywhere, like a prayer. I am going to tell you our story, for love only has one, which is always the same. I met her and loved her, that is all. And for a whole year I have lived on her tenderness, on her caresses, in her arms, in her dresses, on her words, so completely wrapped up, bound and absorbed in everything which came from her that I no longer cared whether it was day or night, or whether I was dead or alive on this old earth of ours. And then, she died. How? I do not know. I no longer know anything. But one evening she came home, wet, for it was raining heavily, and the next day she coughed, and she coughed for about a week and took to her bed. What happened I do not remember now, but doctors came, wrote, and went away. Medicines were brought, and some women made her drink them. Her hands were hot. Her forehead was burning, and her eyes bright and sad. When I spoke to her, she answered me, but I do not remember what we said. I have forgotten everything, everything, everything. She died, and I very well remember her slight, feeble sigh. The nurse said, ah, and I understood, I understood. I knew nothing more, nothing. I saw a priest who said, your mistress? And it seemed to me as if he were insulting her. As she was dead, nobody had the right to say that any longer and I turned him out. 
Another came, who was very kind and tender, and I shed tears when he spoke to me about her. They consulted me about the funeral, but I do not remember anything that they said, though I recollected the coffin and the sound of the hammer when they nailed her down in it. Oh, God. God. She was buried. Buried. She, in that hole. Some people came. Female friends. I made my escape and ran away. I ran and then walked through the streets. Went home. And the next day started on a journey. Yesterday, I returned to Paris, and when I saw my room again, our room, our bed, our furniture, everything that remains of the life of a human being after death, I was seized by such a violent attack of fresh grief that I felt like opening the window and throwing myself out into the street. I could not remain any longer among these things. Between these walls which had enclosed and sheltered her, which retained a thousand atoms of her, of her skin and of her breath, in their imperceptible crevices. I took up my hat to make my escape, and just as I reached the door, I passed the large glass in the hall, which she had put there, so that she might look at herself every day from head to foot as she went out, to see if her toilette looked well and was correct and pretty, from her little boots to her bonnet. I stopped short in front of that looking glass in which she had so often been reflected. So often, so often, that it must have retained her reflection. I was standing there, trembling, with my eyes fixed on the glass, on that flat, profound, empty glass which had contained her entirely, and had possessed her as much as I, as my passionate looks had. I felt as if I loved that glass. I touched it. It was cold. Oh, the recollection. Sorrowful mirror, burning mirror, horrible mirror to make men suffer such torments. Happy is the man whose heart forgets everything that it has contained, everything that has passed before it, everything that has looked at itself in it, or has been reflected in its affection, in its love. How I suffer. I went out without knowing it, without wishing it, and toward the cemetery. I found her simple grave, a white marble cross, with these few words. She loved, was loved, and died. She is there, below, decayed, how horrible. I sobbed with my forehead on the ground, and I stopped there for a long time, a long time. Then I saw that it was getting dark, and a strange, mad wish, the wish of a despairing lover, seized me. I wished to pass the night, the last night, in weeping on her grave. But I should be seen and 
driven out. How was I to manage? I was cunning and got up and began to roam about in that city of the dead. I walked and walked. How small this city is in comparison with the other, the city in which we live. And yet, how much more numerous the dead are than the living. We want high houses, wide streets, and much room for the four generations who see the daylight at the same time, drink water from the spring, and wine from the vines, and eat bread from the plains. And for all the generations of the dead, for all that ladder of humanity that has descended down to us, there is scarcely anything, scarcely anything. The earth takes them back, and oblivion effaces them. Adieu. At the end of the cemetery, I suddenly perceived that I was in its oldest part, where those who had been dead a long time are mingling with the soil, where the crosses themselves are decayed, where, possibly, newcomers will be put tomorrow. It is full of untended roses, of strong and dark cypress trees, a sad and beautiful garden, nourished on human flesh. I was alone, perfectly alone. So I crouched in a green tree and hid myself there completely amid the thick and somber branches. I waited, clinging to the stem, like a shipwrecked man does to a plank. When it was quite dark, I left my refuge and began to walk, softly, slowly, inaudibly, through that ground full of dead people. I wandered about for a long time, but could not find her tomb again. I went on with extended arms, knocking against the tombs with my hands, my feet, my knees, my chest, even with my head, without being able to find her. I groped about like a blind man finding his way. I felt the stones, the crosses, the iron railings, the metal wreaths, and the wreaths of faded flowers. I read the names with my fingers by passing them over the letters. What a night. What a night. I could not find her again. There was no moon. What a night. I was frightened, horribly frightened in these narrow paths between two rows of graves. Graves, 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 nothing but graves. On my right, on my left, in front of me, around me, everywhere there were graves. I sat down on one of them for I could not walk any longer. My knees were so weak. I could hear my heart beat. And I heard something else as well. What? A confused, nameless noise. Was the noise in my head? In the impenetrable night? Or beneath the mysterious earth, the earth sown with human corpses. I looked all around me, 
but I cannot say how long I remained there. I was paralyzed with terror, cold with fright, ready to shout out, ready to die. Suddenly, it seemed to me that this lab of marble on which I was sitting was moving. Certainly it was moving, as if it were being raised. With a bound, I sprang onto the neighboring tomb, and I saw, yes, I distinctly saw the stone which I had just hidden rise upright. Then the dead person appeared, a naked skeleton pushing the stone back with its bent back. I saw it quite clearly, although the night was so dark. On the cross I could read, Here lies Jacques Bolivar, who died at the age of 51. He loved his family, was kind and honorable, and died in the grace of the Lord. The dead man also read what was inscribed on his tombstone. Then he picked up his stone off the path, a little pointed stone, and began to scrape the letters carefully. He slowly defaced them, and with the hollows of his eyes, he looked at the places where they had been engraved. Then, with the tip of the bone that had been his forefinger, he wrote in luminous letters, like those lines which boys trace on walls with the tip of a lucifer match. Here reposes Jacques Bolivar, who died at the age of 51. He hastened his father's death by his unkindness, as he wished to inherit his fortune. He tortured his wife, tormented his children, deceived his neighbors, robbed everyone he could, and died wretched. When he had finished writing, the dead man stood motionless, looking at his work. On turning around, I saw that all the graves were open, that all the dead bodies had emerged from them, and that all had faced the lies inscribed on the gravestones by their relations substituting the truth instead. And I saw that all had been the tormentors of their neighbors. Malicious, dishonest, hypocrites, liars, rogues, calumniators, envious. That they had stolen, deceived, performed every disgraceful, every abominable action. These good fathers, these faithful wives, these devoted sons, these chaste daughters, these honest tradesmen, these men and women who were called irreproachable. They were all writing at the same time on the threshold of their eternal abode, the truth, the terrible and the whole truth of which everybody was ignorant, or pretended to be ignorant, while they were alive. I thought that she also must have written something in her tombstone, and now, running without any fear among the half-open coffins, among the corpses and skeletons, I went toward her, sure that I should find her immediately. I recognized her at once, without seeing her face, which was covered by the winding sheet. Then, on the marble cross,
across where shortly before I had read she loved, was loved, and died. I now saw, having gone out in the rain one day in order to deceive her lover, she caught cold and died. It appears that they found me at daybreak, lying on the grave, unconscious. personality in the dance. Every individual possesses something that, for lack of a better word, is termed personality. Something elusive and evasive that cannot easily be defined or explained, but nevertheless remains the essential quality that distinguishes its possessor from every other human being. But while all may have the potentiality for some distinct and special attribute, unfortunately, for by far the greater number, this is never developed or expressed, and they pass through their uneventful, monotonous existence without even realizing their capacity for being or doing something outside the routine of their daily occupations. In this era of the newest of sciences, psychoanalysis, which is attracting the study and investigation of millions, much attention is being given to the explanation of the failure of so many persons to find an outlet for hidden capacities by the well-worn inferiority complex. The flower of personality, we are told, is born to blush unseen because of an individual's belief that he or she is in some way inferior. Despite all the books that have been written, all the good advice that has been given, urging the development of self-confidence as the starting point of worthy accomplishment, there is still all too prevalent an attitude of timidity and hesitation that says, in effect, I can't be what I would like to be, so what's the use in trying? This inability or unwillingness to believe in oneself, the disposition to doubt one's powers, to admit defeat before trying, is nowhere more clearly apparent than in the attitude of many persons who possess the physical and mental qualifications that with proper training would bring distinction and profit as exponents of the dance. They admire the successful dancers. They feel that they too are capable of expressing themselves through this art. But, and here comes the cold water that quenches the spark of their ambition. They are timid, afraid of failure. They fear that they have the persistence and capacity for application that is needed to assure success. Perhaps they do make an attempt but the work is hard. They just know they won't be able to stick it out. And after a few futile efforts, they give it up and spend the rest of their lives wondering what they might have accomplished if they had persevered. To these two easily discouraged persons, the message of the dance is, what others have done, you can do. You have the physique, or at least it can be developed. You have the intelligence to accept instruction. You have the patience needed continued repetition of movement that makes perfection. You have an individuality that can be expressed in the subtle shading and delicate touches that growing skill will enable you to show in every graceful movement. You have in you 
capacity for artistic and harmonious expression of your personality. Why not develop it? I cannot emphasize too strongly the importance of personality in a successful stage career, along with the actual mastering of the dancing steps and the acquisition of health in a beautiful body comes just as surely the development of one's personal qualities. And because each person has an individuality which is distinctive from that of everyone else, all must select the type of dancing which is best suited to their own personality. That is why the performance of stars like Evelyn Law, Marilyn Miller, Anne Pennington, Gilda Gray, and Fred and Adelaide Astaire gave a lasting impression. Every step, every movement is designed to drive home the characteristics of their individuality. Even more important than the actual dancing steps they do is the manner in which they execute them, the individuality that they express. It is the almost incredible factor called personality which lifts one out of the ranks of the chorus and makes the soul a dancer. In this book, I am trying to help you develop your personality in the same way that I have discovered and developed that quality in so many of today's theatrical stars. Most emphatically, I want to impress upon you that it is not chorus work that you are learning in my courses. It is professional and individual dancing that when masters gives one that certain something that one lacked before, a feeling of having accomplished a sure success. Anyone who masters the dances takes on a certain confident feeling at time, after exercising great patience and practice. With this confidence, the happy pupil radiates a new magnetic personality which the audience feels. But more about this later on, when you will learn just how one's self is injected into the dances, until they are vitalized and become the living embodiment of emotions and spirit of the dance. This is putting one's own personality into the dance, and is one secret to every great artist's success, which we will seek to instill into the minds of all our students. And one day, when I found the teacher out,
It is the impersonal expression abstracted from the state of things of which the government is the personification. Then such expressions as abolition of the state or society without the state agree perfectly with the conception which anarchists wish to express of the destruction of every political institution based on authority and of the constitution of a free and equal society based upon the harmony of interests and the voluntary contribution of all to the satisfaction of social needs. However, the word state has many other significations, and among these, some which lend themselves to misconstruction, particularly when used among men whose sad social position has not afforded them leisure to become accustomed to the delicate distinctions of scientific language, or still worse, when adopted treacherously by adversaries who are interested in confounding the sense or do not wish to comprehend. Thus the word state is often used to indicate any given society or collection of human beings united on a given territory and constituting what is called a social unit independently of the way in which the members of the said body are grouped or of their relations existing between them. State is used also simply as a synonym for society. Owing to these significations of the word, our adversaries believe, or rather profess to believe, that anarchists wish to abolish every social relation and all collective work, and to reduce man to a condition of isolation, that is, to a state worse than savagery. By state, again, is meant only the supreme administration of a country, the central power, distinct from provincial or communal power, and therefore, Others think that anarchists wish merely for a territorial decentralization, leaving the principle of government intact, and thus confounding anarchy with cantonal or communal government. Finally, state signifies condition, mode of living, the order of social life, etc. And therefore we say, for example, that it is necessary to change the economic state of the working classes, or that the anarchical state is the only state founded on the principles of solidarity and other similar phrases. So that if we say also in another sense that we wish to abolish the state, we may at once appear absurd or contradictory. For these reasons, we believe it would be better to use the expression abolition of the state as little as possible and to substitute for it another clearer and more concrete abolition of government. In any case, the latter will be the expression used in the course of this little work. There was confusion in the Harmon's house the next day. I did no work, but sat idly with the girls in their sitting room while they talked over the ball. They were full of the new beauty, Miss Hatherley. And such an odd thing, Mary. Gerald says she reminds him of you. Quite impossible, said I, but I thank him. 
Something in her voice and way of talking, Betty went on. You have a nice voice, you know. Gerald says she is very original, and goodness knows he had opportunity enough of finding out he danced with no one else. I nearly contradicted that statement, but saved myself in time. I'm so sorry I couldn't go, I said instead. Did Miss Sturgis enjoy herself? And are you really better? said Betty. You didn't seem ill in the afternoon, and as for Bella... Oh, Bella, interrupted Clara. Bella had best look to her laurels. No one noticed her while Miss Hatherley was in the room. I went on with my questions. Do you suppose Miss Hatherley enjoyed her success? They laughed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why, yes, if she's like other girls. Perhaps she isn't. Do all girls enjoy being admired at the expense of someone else? Clara looked out of the window with an assumption of unconsciousness. Betty, who is more candid, answered at once, One can't help liking it. I laughed outright. Does Miss Hatherley seem nice? I asked next. Charming, said Clara. We have taken quite a fancy to her. Mother is writing today to ask her to dine and go to the theatre with us tomorrow. That was Gerald's idea. I received this piece of news in silence. Everyone wants to know her, Clara went on. Dr. Trefusis was overwhelmed with questions and inquiries as to whether people might call and so on. She paints all day through and works quite hard as though she had to do it. Odd, isn't it? Why odd? said I. I suppose she likes it. But a passion for art is unnecessary in a pretty woman, no doubt. And Betty broke in with, Oh, there you go again, Mary, always finding fault with pretty women. Not with them, my dear, but with the world, I said, laughing. You can't say I find fault with you, Betty. Oh, I'm not pretty, said she. Why, Miss Hatherley? I was touched by her speech. You're a generous creature, I said. I have always supposed it a mistake to think that one pretty girl is jealous of another. Betty put her head on one side, and with an odd mixture of wisdom and drollery answered, Well, we like beauty, and we don't. We like it because it's interesting and exciting and successful, and a pretty girl gives one's house a certain reputation. We don't approve when she annexes people who belong to us, naturally. All the same, we can't help feeling she must do as she pleases. She's privileged. I had no idea you were so profound, said Clara, a little sharply, and I wondered whether it is possible that women are more tenacious of an intellectual than of a physical superiority. Betty only laughed. I'm off, <laughs> said she. I promised to meet the Sturgises in the park, but Gerald won't come, and I'm half afraid to face Bella alone. Goodbye, Mary. We'll ask you to meet Miss Hatherley when we know her better. When I got home, I found that Dr. Trefusis had sent on Lady Harmon's letter. I sat over it for some time, thinking. Then I wrote and said I would go. Miss Waitley looked at me wistfully when I told her. I'm afraid you will get into some trouble, Mary, she said, and you can't possibly wear the ball dress. I must go, I retorted. I am at last seeing life as a woman ought to see it. I can't give up the privilege, at least not yet. You won't give it up till you have paid the penalty, Miss Waitley answered. I shrugged my shoulders, as though I did not believe her. I must have another dress, I cried. Miss Waitley would have given me the clothes off her back, she said, but as that would not avail me much, she offered to lend me some money. I accepted the offer with a recklessness born of my strange position, and we went out shopping, after sunset, Mary Hatherley and Miss Waitley. The people in the shops seemed anxious to please me, even when they found that I could afford to pay but little for what I wanted. 
they probably looked upon me as a good advertisement, and I enjoyed the novelty of being treated with a deferential consideration. It was a very cold night. As we passed along the freezing, gas-lit streets, we met but few people. We had to cross the square in which Dr. Trefusis lived on our way home. I noticed, before we reached his door, that a man in a fur overcoat was pacing slowly up and down the pavement. Why did he linger in such weather? I wondered vaguely. Then I saw it was Gerald Harmon. I put my muff up to my face and passed him by. I knew, too well, that he was waiting on the chance of seeing Mary Hatherley on her way home from a day's work at the studio. You do not work very late these foggy days, I suppose, he asked me tentatively the next evening at dinner. I make gaslight studies, said I shortly. Is it permitted to anybody to go and see you at work? Oh no, I answered with a smile. I paint in earnest. I waited an hour in Dorchester Square last night, he went on very long the hope of seeing you. That was misplaced heroism, said I, in such weather. I should advise you not to do it again. I shall do it every evening, he declared, and I only laughed a little, as though the subject were not of the remotest interest, and turned to my neighbour. Gerald sat by me at the play. I went so seldom to the theatre that I was always arrested by the interest of the piece and of the actors. I sat in the front of the box by Lady Harmon, who, I was certain, suffered under the uneasy sensation that she was taking a leap in the dark in encouraging a young, unknown woman, with nothing to recommend her but her looks. Though, on the other hand, she was upheld by the authoritative voice of society, which had pronounced a favourable verdict on me. Behind us were Gerald and Betty. It was such an intimate family party that I had great difficulty in not using the familiar tone of every day. And I had only just saved myself from calling Betty by her Christian name and pointing out an acquaintance of Gerald's, whom I knew by sight, in the stalls. I was sobered. Silence fell upon me. I was so acutely aware of Gerald's presence which seemed like a light at which I could not bear to look, but I tried to distract myself by noting the faces of the other people in the house till the curtain should rise. Here and there I caught glimpses of a pretty head, the graceful turn of a neck, an expression of happiness or of vivacity, but the audience was mostly ugly, dull and uninteresting. Yet I felt sorry for all these people for their inarticulate, dumb way of going through life, untouched by passion, save in its baser aspects, or only apprehending the ideal through some conventionalized form of religion, or some dim discontent. The play was Romeo and Juliet. The Juliet was beautiful, but she could only look the part and the young man who acted Romeo was no ideal lover. Yet the immortal golden play of youth and passion drew tears and quickened heartbeats, for each woman in the house was Juliet, tasting some rapture, perhaps lost, perhaps never realized, a first love. The curtain dropped. I sat in a dream and Lady Harmon's voice seemed to come from very far away. It's a pretty play, she said, but don't you think it's rather a muddle? I never can make out who is who. It doesn't matter, answered Betty. Don't trouble, mother dear. What a lovely thing it would be for private theatricals, parts of it, that is. Gerald, wouldn't Bella make a good Juliet? Her remark might or might not have been malicious, but Gerald started. Bella, he ejaculated, and looked at me. 
His look said plainly what his lips had not yet dared. No man had ever looked at me with entreaty, passion, humility in his eyes. I looked back at him, the soul of Mary Gower speaking through the eyes of Mary Haverley. He flushed and went pale again, and I regretted what I had done. For the rest of the evening I devoted myself to Lady Harmon. Gerald seemed lost in thought, and only roused himself when the carriage stopped at Dr. Trefusis's door. I shall never see you alone, said he, as we stood on the doorstep. I cannot talk to you. I must write to you, he ended with a sort of despairing impatience. Do not write, said I, and then the door was opened by the doctor in person. Gerald seemed hardly able to speak to him. When a few words had passed, he went back abruptly to the carriage. Mary, said Dr. Trefusis, you are a great trouble to me. Now I've got to take you home and interrupt my studies in Rosenkrantz and the Pope Honorius, most absorbing old impostors. No, I won't say that, for I'm beginning to think there may be some method in their madness. You have led me into devious paths, Mary Haverley. By the way, Who's that good-looking young fellow? That's Gerald Harmon, said I. The doctor looked at me with a sort of inquisitive sympathy and shrugged his shoulders. When he left me at my own house, You are playing with fire, my dear, he said. And I'm an old fool to help you. You are helping me to buy the experience that teaches, I said. And it teaches bitter lessons enough. Don't fear for me. For the comedy. Where you go to the theater yesterday? Yes, sir. I want to see the new play in which did owe to play an actress which has not appeared on any theater. How you think her? She has very much grace in the deeds, great deal of exactness on the declamation, the constitution very agreeable, and a delightful voice. What you say at the comedy, have her succeeded? It was a drama. It was whisted to the third scene of the last act. Because of that? It haunt the vehicle and the intrigue it was bad conducted. So that they won't wait it, even the upshot? No, it was divined. In the meantime, they did deliver justice to the players, which generally have played very well. At the exception by a one self, who had land very much her part? It want to have not any indulgence towards the bat buffoons. Have you seen already the new tragedy? They praise her very much. It is multitude already. Never I had seen the parlor so full. This actor he make very well her part. Her piece is full of interest. It have wondered the spectators. The curtains let down. Go out us. 